it's back. I think I'm about to be a pioneer right now because I think I'm the first YouTuber to say these words and actually sincerely mean it. I did not want to make this video. Usually when I have issues with somebody to the point of making a video on it, I tend to revel in the sort of conflict between it because I think it's best to turn it into a source of entertainment than stress. However, with this issue in particular, I have gone down every avenue I could to deal with this quietly and pragmatically. Unfortunately, making a video on it seems to be the only solution I have left, and believe me, it was the last resort I wanted to take. Today we're talking about the Xander brand slash Xander brand digital slash Digital Lake Media slash one teenager LARPing as a CEO of a media corporation. The level of aggravation that I have had to bear from this man is perplexing. What started out as just two acquaintances in the same high school class has now escalated to him fraudulently taking legal action against my YouTube channel. On my channel's anniversary, no less. Five years, by the way, thank you. If the name Xander Brand sounds familiar, it is because Xander was the executive producer of my game show series, Depravity. Now, materially, he would provide me some money that I would use to buy materials for the episodes. Now, in order, I am going to list absolutely everything that he paid for. He paid for one light used in every episode, two lavalier mics used in episode three, three digital audio recorders used in episodes three and four, one foosball table featured in episode three, not two, like he is incorrectly claiming he has paid for, one and the shock collar featured in episode 3. That is everything that Xander has paid for. For contrast, I paid for the prize money in the first two episodes, which cost $130. I paid for the materials to construct the set, and I paid for many of the materials used in punishments. I used my camera equipment, I used my laptops, I used my microphones, and I had my sisters help record the first two episodes. My partner Katie paid for several of the materials used for episodes. They paid for my train ticket to go back and forth from shooting locations to my house. They paid for a new GoPro, the GoPro that is currently recording this video. They helped develop branding, they drew original art for the series, they helped consult me on developing the series, etc, etc. Eric, the real Eric, generously let us use his car during the Travis Scott punishment, and he also drove Katie out to my house for the first two episodes of Depravity, which I believe Katie paid for a part of the gas money for. He also used his car to bring us to the grocery store in the Repeat After Me punishment. Daniel T. Gaming paid for a lot of the materials in the first episode of the show, so did my friend Logan and Dawn and Jonas and a ton of people that I probably can't even think of because not that Xander would know this because he does not create content. It takes a lot of people to create a project like this. There's a lot of cooperation and time. However, if he wants to have this idea that he is solely the most significant funder of the series. He is not. Despite how I foolishly credited him just to compliment his ego, he did not have as significant of a role as he might lead you to believe. Going back a bit, Xander is actually someone I've known for quite a while. We went to the same high school a few years ago, but my first experience with his brand was when he followed me one day on Twitter in the middle of class. Now, from which Twitter page he followed me, I will never know because he has so, so many different ones. We have Joseph Alexander Simpson, real Joseph Alexander Simpson, full force with Joseph Alexander Simpson, the Xander brand, Xander brand podcast network, the Xander Brand Music Group, Xander Brand Games, Xander Brand Equilibrium, Xander Brand Digital, Xander Brand Fault, Shop Xander Brand, Do Not Shop Xander Brand, Xander Brand Pride and Equity, Breaking the Ozone, Create Indie, The Disagreement Brothers Show, Getting the Shovel, Joseph Alexander Simpson Saturday's Live Mic, Pride of Elements, this news thing that I forgot to write in my script and I genuinely can't think of the name of it. And of course, Midpoint Americana. That's 20 fucking Twitter accounts. Not including the ones that got suspended for spam. I wonder why that happened. Now let me make it crystal clear that the only reason he has so many Twitter accounts is to artificially generate interactions and impressions for his own Twitter pages to make it seem like anyone gives a shit about him. If you look at any of his Twitter accounts, the overwhelming majority of the likes and followers he has are just these other accounts that he also manages. I, it's like fucking Split or something. Like, it, it genuinely feels like this guy has dissociative personality disorder. This guy fucking types up 
prints out and signs contracts to enforce upon himself. Like, for God's sake, do you not think what you're doing is a little bit ridiculous? Now, I found humor in this, so a few months later, I volunteered myself to become a part of Xanderbrand. I was put on as an editor and a content coordinator, I believe. I don't know what my... My job title was that I didn't get paid shit for. I was a guest on a podcast, I edited two episodes of his podcast, and the way he repaid me was kicking me off of the team with no discussion prior to it, and redacting my name from the title and description credits of the episodes that I worked on. After he kicked me off, the channel floundered for a few months, with Xander just making more and more podcasts just to release one episode of it and then quit it and delete it. It's his typical M.O. So let's fast forward a bit to December 2020. I'm not sure how exactly I got into contact with him, but I ended up asking him if he wanted to fund this new series I was making, Depravity. So, um, what have you been doing recently? So I've been working on a couple of series for my own channel that I'm working on getting funding for and building a set for. The first of them is like a, uh, a game show series, that's all I want to disclose about that, really? We eventually agreed that he would provide some funding, he made it sound like he would provide a lot more than he actually did. In exchange for funding the series, I offered integrated ads, uncensored cuts on his channel, and those uncensored cuts airing a week before episodes would air on my channel, along with episode 2 airing on the same day as episode 1 on his channel when it would, you know, not be released on my channel for a month. This was all our agreement was, and I upheld every part of it. Notably, I did not exchange rights to the series Depravity. There was no contract written up in which I transferred rights over to him. There was not even so much as a written agreement that I transferred rights over to him, which will be important later on. Now, the United States has what's called first to use copyright law, meaning that the creator of an unlicensed and uncopyrighted material still holds the rights to it automatically. They do not need to go the legal route and file for copyright to protect it. By me making depravity, I am entitled to the rights of it. I know this sounds like a very basic fucking concept, but it's something that Xander Brand seems to have a difficult time understanding. I am the holder of depravity. It is my show. I own the rights to it. Now later on, he says he's going to allow me $300 a year to produce more episodes for Depravity. Splendid. Over the next year, after episode 4 had aired, this $300 never materialized. So, obviously, neither did the episodes. We then had a voice call in which he stated next year I'd be receiving $1,500 for a yearly budget. Splendid. But, unsurprisingly, this money also never materialized. So, episodes didn't materialize. He he then tells me that he emailed me regarding what he wants to see in the 2023 season for Depravity. Splendid! So I go ahead and I open my email and I cannot find the email he sent me anywhere in my inbox, even in my spam. Which email? Hey dude. Yo dude. Yo. For two months, I didn't hear a single word from him. Which is odd, considering this information seems pretty critical to this thing he's intending on funding. He finally reaches out to me just to say, email sent. Splendid! I checked my email and he's asking for the original project media files and graphics package for depravity. He claims this is for social media posts. Now, I was a little bit put off by this, but credulously, I just decided that there's no harm in it and I started to go through with it. But before I can even upload these files, he emails me again, forwarding his previous email from two months ago, asking about the 2023 season of depravity. Now get this. In this email, in exchange for $1,500, he fully expected me to create 24 new episodes weekly in a six month time frame. 24 half hour to an hour long episodes. For reference, all four episodes of Depravity up to this point have probably cost on the lower end of maybe a thousand dollars. Not to mention it takes weeks of coordination and planning to get an episode put together and finished. $1,500 for 24 episodes gives me an episode budget of $62.50. Listen up, white man. That project on that scale wouldn't be feasible for $1.5 million dollars, not even 1.5 thousand. For one person? No. I cannot even illustrate how insulting it is to be proposed such a ludicrously ignorant figure. Once again, let me put into perspective the actual process for creating an episode of Depravity. First, I need to get the questions. 
I usually get my sister or a friend to write the question. They then seal them in envelopes. Next, I need to plan punishments. Every episode has between 10 and 13 unique punishments for that episode. That takes time to think of. Then, I have to get materials. For episodes 3 and 4, that means I had to get the foosball table, the dog shocker, the secret pancakes, the vinegar, the deodorant, the vanilla extract, the rubber bands, the duct tape, the puzzles, the jelly beans, the clothespins, the dog treats, the bag of ice, and even stuff we didn't get to use like the mouse traps. That costs money. That takes time to go out and get that shit. That takes time to make sure that everything has got something and everyone knows what happens when you land on a punishment. It takes effort. Something that is antithetical to the Xander brand motto. Once I get that shit together, I need to update the wheel. I need to get the set put together, putting up tablecloths. I need to find who I can get to be contestants for that episode who I can get to be a cinematographer. And then finally, once the episode is filmed, I need to edit it and condense it down to a 30 to 45 minute time slot. The raw footage for these episodes can be between two and three hours long, so it's not a very easy task to do. It takes time and it takes skill and it takes sacrificing good bits of footage in exchange for better ones. And you expect me to do all that every week for $62? This is just a single example of Xander's reigning ignorance over the actual creative process of making fucking anything. He likes to go on saying that he wants to be creative and start a media brand, but other than podcasts and midpoint Americana, he's done absolutely nothing. And I'm being really generous with even mentioning Midpoint Americana at all. While we're on the subject, he attempted to launch a GoFundMe page to pay for a series he wants to make centralized around Burlington, North Carolina. This is to celebrate the town, which is of course why the description of the show describes the town as a town filled by drugs, violence, poverty, and corruption. It was filled by all those things. Not one of those things skipped it. It was a train run on that town. It was extremely disgusting and horrific. He also popped up a website meant to persuade you into donating to fund the series. Let's go ahead and read some of the episode synopses. Episode 5. We look through Cass, Ryan, and Annabelle's early life and how they got where they are. Well, that does not make me confident. It's okay, guys. I'm sure he totally fleshed out this idea in his head and he's got a beginning, middle, and end planned out and this isn't just a simple blurb put up to pretend that he's actually making progress on this. I don't know where you would get that supposition. Episode 7. Mr. McCauley calls out Cass for not grieving properly. It's capitalized for some reason. Cass sneaks in and out of his grandparents' factory to sleep at night, but gets caught, causing him to go home and burn his house down in rage. See, ironically, now you've overshared the plot. That point where Cass burns down his house seems to be some sort of shock, like you're meant to watch that and be, holy shit, man, he's really going off the deep end here. I gotta watch, I gotta donate right now. I guess I'm skipping that episode. Episode eight, Cass serves community service for burning down his apartment. Well, now it's an apartment and he gets community service for that? <laughs> episode nine, following Cass and Annabelle's breakup, Annabelle reevaluates her goals and ideals. That's the entire episode, and we're gonna make 22 or even 44 minutes of that, don't worry. Please donate money to us. The strangest thing about this is that some of these synopses are very rudimentary concepts that clearly have no development or fleshed out parts at all. Meanwhile, some of them outright spoil the entire plot. It's just frankly incompetent. Let's take a look at the character bios. Joshua Cass E.D. Stevenson. Joshua Cass E.D. Stevenson is a white 17-year-old boy who supports his ill mother through his job at his maternal grandparents' sock factory, all while going to school, being very attracted to his peers and denouncing regular teen behaviors like dating, social media, and parties. He hates dating, but he is very much attracted to his peers. It is actually a very serious problem. He's been caught masturbating several times in the middle of class. I wonder what his inspiration for this character is. Why do TV shows always having boiling romance between two characters? Is it to make me jealous that I have no one? And that I'm pathetically lonely and have been for the last five years? And only had two relationships ever that never went past hand-holding? Who else has noticed this? 
Cash's world turns upside down when he gets hurt and begins taking prescription drugs at the end of episode one. The horror. Big Pharma is the real villain here. Oh, in case you were worried, he does make sure to specifically clarify which race each character is as the first detail he gives away. Xander is nothing if he's not inclusive of his idiocy or his e-bagging. Yeah, you want to wager a guess at how much he was asking for this project? I guarantee you, his absolute blind confidence in his projects is staggering. Two and a half million dollars reduced from three and a half Whew. because this website instills two and a half million dollars of confidence in you right this man looks like someone you'd want to give your credit card information to found a guy with a 20 million dollar trust said he'd help with midpoint well i'm glad that you know how to specifically take advantage of people that you just met to try and leverage your own idiotic project by the way i am devastated to report that he did not in fact help out and frankly it's their loss i cannot imagine why someone would not want to work with this intelligent business mogul i mean even his video trying to pitch the series was goddamn flawless. Hello everyone, my name is Joseph Alexander Simpson, and last year I set out to produce a TV show based on my hometown of Burlington, North Carolina, called Midpoint Americana. I put out a public project proposal, a website, and a pilot episode script out to the public along with a GoFundMe page. Unfortunately, even with local news coverage, we did not reach our goal. However, I'm giving myself and the public a second chance at looking at this project. A second chance? Ah, yes, because there was absolutely nothing wrong with your first project attempt. It was just a major fluke of luck. There was nothing you could have done to improve it. There was nothing wrong with your project page or your creepy advertising tactics, like mass texting thousands of numbers in the Burlington area to solicit donations. You know, as a wise man once said, if at first you don't succeed, do the same exact thing and expect different results. Midpoint Americana. Maybe a TV show one day. And I like the idea of that. So I've put together a first look at what this show may look like. Oh, be advised, this is what it may look like. Please donate money, because... This thing that I'm trying to pitch to you, it could be totally different from this. It could be a choose-your-own-adventure novel that's 48 pages long. Fuck if I know, I'm just gonna absolve responsibility in any regard I can. I'm just gonna absolve all responsibility in any way I can. I set out with some friends to record some areas of Burlington. I got my mom to record Cass's lines. Dude, please do not involve your folks into this. I promise you, they are probably sick and tired of this Xanderbrand crap. This is Budget. This is phone recordings, this is, um, <laughs> me getting my friends to help with this. Without a budget? Oh, I'm sure I won't even notice. Please, play the goddamn video already. I need your help. I'm looking for a literary agent to connect me to people in Hollywood so that I can actually get this to a studio. Even if I get funds on GoFundMe, that doesn't guarantee that it's gonna become a thing. And you're telling me you didn't get funded with lines like that? I'm flummoxed. Play the goddamn video! Well, this is it. My hometown. A true midpoint Americana. Fantastic audio narration, pal. Great backtrack, too. You really know how to level audio. By the way, this badly color-corrected, artificially sharpened footage goes on for like 60 to 70 percent of the actual pitch. It's okay because it is also interspersed with handycam shots from the ground showing random brick buildings, so at least there's that. Without a budget, too. Xander, if you ever hope to get funding for this project, could you consider, like, playing toward your strengths? You're bad at editing, you're bad at narrating, you're bad at acting, you're bad at writing, but what you are good at is being both extremely obnoxious and delusionally confident in your idiotic, insane ideas. Find a way to make that into a TV show because you're a goddamn natural at it. If you want people to pay to see something from you, 
you first need to actually make content that they enjoy before you get there. If you want to be successful, you need the drive to do it. You can't just ask for money and then have it fall into your lap and then make that project. That's not how success works. And your sheer avarice in this GoFundMe is just fucking pathetic. It gives this air that you believe your success is something that you're just entitled to and that you're only being held back because of money. The fact is, Xander, is that yes, obviously there's advantages to being born into better financial situations, but frankly, you still need to have the drive to create something. Success is something that people fucking work for. If you do not put in the drive and the work to try and become successful, then you will not become successful. You don't get to ask other people to do the hard part for you, and then you just coast on that. That's the thing that's most frustrating about the false channel strike that you put on my YouTube channel, is that this is my body of work that I've been cultivating for the past five years. And for absolutely no reason at all, you didn't even have anything to gain from it. You put a false channel strike jeopardizing my channel. Going back to our emails, I negotiated with him from doing 24 episodes to 8 episodes. That is still very unreasonable, but it is doable. I could do that, and because I have the drive and motivation to do it, I would probably have pulled that off, because I like creating things, and I have the drive to make things. I then asked him if he would pay the entire sum of $1,500 all at once, or if it would be incrementally per episode. He then gave a surprisingly normal reaction by pulling the fucking plug on the entire project, stating he would no longer be funding the show, or as he put it, canceled it. Oh sorry, uh, fuck, I misread my script. It's not normal, it's batshit fucking psychotic. He then went on to social media where he both could not decide how many L's go in the word cancelled and also could not decide how many L's he would be taking for his career to make a public fuss that Depravity, a show that is mine, not his, has been cancelled by him. Four days after he cancels Depravity, he makes this tweet stating, something new is coming soon. Now I admire using the white outline on yellow letters on a yellow background. Professional here. The picture has the exact same tricolor branding as Depravity, the same exact font and stroke style as Depravity. It's about as close to identical as his imbecile brain could replicate. I messaged him asking what Project RYB would be. Now in the meantime, I was discussing this situation with a friend. My friend sarcastically remarked that it would be very funny if he decided to announce his own identical show with a slightly different name. Don't worry, I wouldn't steal your show. Bruh. Now he makes a post with a logo that is, again, identical to the Depravity logo, with the same font and colors. On top of that, he tweeted it with a caption that is verbatim the opening to Depravity. Welcome to a game that tests your mind and body to its fullest limits. A game of deception, mistrust, betrayal, and punishment. Ah. Three contenders will need to use all of these to win riches beyond their wildest dreams. If you have a pre-existing heart condition, I recommend skipping this one because this game is of absolute depravity! Now in response to this, a friend of mine jumped in stating that Xander is plagiarizing my content. So then Xander messaged me saying that he's been making jokes slash references due to depravity. To fucking who? I promise, it was satire. It was just a prank. I'm actually just pretending to rip off my so-called friend's show. I'm not actually doing it. Do you get the joke? Isn't that funny? I'm also pretty confident this is why he wanted the original assets to the show, so he could replicate the graphics easier. Xander then tries to say we had an agreement that I would repay him for the costs incurred on his end. We did not make such an agreement. He attaches a screenshot of deleted user nebulously commenting on possible deals. This proves nothing. This doesn't even show that I'm agreeing to him. He then provides an invoice where, as I already pointed out, he incorrectly lists the foosball table twice. But regardless, I do not owe you anything, Xander. We did not sign any contracts. We did not make any written agreements. This is nothing. You paid for the show. You got my end of the deal. That's it. You do not have the rights to the show, and you do not have the right to fucking file a copyright strike against me. Speaking of which, 
we're finally on that. On the 27th of September, at 3 in the morning, all four episodes of Depravity were hit with a copyright claim, and the claimant elected to hit my channel with a copyright strike. For those unaware, when you claim content on YouTube, you have a few options as to what you'd like to do to the person that you are claiming. The claimants can remove the video, claim the ad revenue, or allow the video to remain live for a period of time before removing it. Along with this, they can also decide if they would like to hit the channel with a strike. A copyright strike can inhibit a creator's ability to upload, use custom thumbnails or comment, and other bad things that make things really inconvenient for the creator. These strikes are meant for when you commit a serious offense against YouTube's terms of service. It is punitive, and it puts your channel in a vulnerable position. Three strikes, and your YouTube channel is terminated. Now, Fortunately, other than my YouTube videos being removed that I've spent weeks working on, I haven't suffered any other consequences from this strike. That being said, it does not negate the demonstrable fraud that's been committed. I told Xander to remove the copyright strike on my channel, to which Xander claimed that he had absolutely no idea what was going on. Now, I'm assuming he expected me to believe that it was just an automated claim on YouTube's behalf and that he had no clue about it. However, I don't think he knew that YouTube tells you whether a claim was manual or automatic. I told him that the claim was manual, and he alleged that it was not him, but it was his legal team that filed the copyright strike at 3 in the morning. Xander, if this was your legal team, I would cut ties with them, like, yesterday. Considering whoever filed that copyright claim broke the law. You see, the YouTube Copyright ID system was a system that was put in place in compliance with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1998. That law is meant to give copyright holders control over how their media is shared on the internet. If someone is illegally uploading your video, then there needs to be some sort of system for that copyright holder to go and claim that video. Now, claiming a video is using that law to protect your content. You know, if it is your content. Filing a false copyright claim, however, is illegal as it is perjury. It even says so right when you file a claim that if you lie, you are committing perjury. For the record, I would bet every fucking penny in my bank account that something fishy is going on here. First of all, the email from YouTube tells me that the email address of the person that submitted the claim was the same one as Xander's. Interestingly enough, that is my email. Well, I'm glad we agree, Xander, because that's also interesting to me. He then tries to explain that his information is on the email because he technically co-signed it, but at the same time, he also didn't know what the fuck he was co-signing, I guess. Now, Xander, be fucking honest. How many people are re-uploading your content? How many people are even doing business with you other than formerly me? You're not fooling anyone. Xander then forwarded an email conversation between him and his legal team, which is definitely not just him talking to himself, because he's never done that before, with identical signatures and everything. But at the end of this conversation, he resolves that he would like to remove the strike on my channel, stating that I had permission to upload those videos. I don't need his permission to upload those videos, but regardless, I still have the right to upload those videos because it's my fucking content. So I go through the appropriate process, which is to submit a counter notification for all four of the copyright claims, and then I then go directly to him to make it crystal clear that he does not own depravity. He did not have the right to even co-sign that claim to begin with if it genuinely wasn't him and he's blowing money on a legal team that's doing nothing. But regardless, even though he said that the claim has taken care of, at the time of recording, I still have a copyright strike on my YouTube channel and all four of those videos are still down. So this was my final move to publicly lay out everything that I've had to deal with for the past two years with this fucking guy and hopefully with some heat on him, he will come to his senses and realize that what he is doing is illegal and seriously fucked up. Remove the strike or fucking sue me, Xander. You know you had no right to do that, and you know what you did was fucked up. And you know that you lied about removing it. So do it. So I've decided to record an addendum to this video because a lot has transpired since I originally recorded it. After I recorded the video, I made a tweet saying that Real Joseph Alexander Simpson has illegally put a copyright strike on my channel and removed all four episodes of my series Depravity. When confronted, he claimed he had no idea it even happened, then said the claim was taken care of. It wasn't, channel strike still remains. He then quote retweeted it, saying, I don't like public statements about legal actions taken by an independent team I've hired. 
That sucks, Xander, because I also don't like illegal copyright strikes on my channel and my videos being suppressed. There was an agreement in place when the show was created, and my legal team felt like we had the rights to the show's intellectual property. Xander, you did not make an intellectual property trademark claim, you made a copyright claim. The copyright is the videos themselves, it is what is recorded and put out. Trademark are things like the format, the logo, etc, etc. Regardless, you did not have either of them, but you cannot even get this shit consistent. I've asked YouTube to reinstate his videos as they were permitted to be posted, at the time, wonder what he means by that, per our agreement. Any actions taken beyond that are being done by an independent legal counsel, counsel is misspelled, who are way more engrossed in IP law because I didn't go to law school. Again, he's now trying to claim that he owns the IP, which is trademark, when he does not. He's changing his wording strategically to try and weasel himself out of what he did. You didn't make a trademark claim, you made a copyright claim, and you put a copyright strike on my YouTube channel. The creator went back on his word about what could be accomplished, I assume based on new information. I have not gone back on any word that I have given to him. Essentially, I gave you the best version of Depravity so that people would go and watch it on your channel. And even still, you've covered it full of fucking watermarks and bullshit like that, so... So I guess you sabotage that, but... That's not my fault. We've tried to work with the creator to continue creating episodes, however, he is no longer wishing to negotiate. I only cut off negotiation after in the emails when you cancelled the show and didn't respond to me for four days. You tried to reinitiate negotiation and act like nothing happened four days afterwards, but that's when I said that I don't want to work with you anymore. I was friends with the creator, and while I hope we can get back on the right foot, I plan on taking further legal actions if he continues in the direction he's going. So now he is trying to intimidate me because me talking out about this is getting a lot of people against him because he is so obviously, indefensibly in the wrong, and he keeps doubling down upon that. Nobody is buying your LARPing that you have hired a legal team for the atom-sized backlog of content you have. This legal team would not have broken the law to put a strike on my channel at 3 in the morning. It's the dumbest lie in history, yet you keep doubling down. He then says, no one broke any laws. As I've stated earlier, making a false copyright claim is illegal. Before this, you talked about threatening further legal action, but now you're saying that no legal action was taken at all? He continues to lie about this, even when the evidence is put in front of his face. And then he goes, it may not have been fraudulent. Again, this sounds very threatening, as if he has any authority to do fucking anything that he's done so far. He says earlier that he submitted an email to YouTube to remove the videos, and now he's saying three days later, oh, it might not have been fraudulent after all. I don't want to go ahead and read the entire Twitter thread, because I think that'd be one, very boring content, and two, would just be restating a lot of what I said in this video. But he really just doubles and triples down upon this lie that he has a legal team, and that he's really successful in making thousands of dollars a month on his shitty content, because he has no idea how many views he would actually need to even make $1,000. His CPM must be like $50,000 if that's the case. I could only hope to hold you onto my arms It would make me so warm inside I was only wanting the idea of us existing Would be like a car crash, it's cool to collide you know what, guys, never mind. His content might be good enough for him to earn thousands of dollars a year off of it. It's really avant-garde sort of stuff. That's why the lyrics don't actually match with the melody or the rhythm of the backtrack at all. Yeah, go ahead and tune in to Xander Rand Music Group if you want to be part of the next musical revolution. This is critique, by the way, so that way I could legally play that clip beforehand, just in case Xander's legal team needs to know about the law. But yeah, he's a pathological liar, and I would highly advise that you stay far away from him.